most nights I'd fall into bed too exhausted to sleep, wishing I'd taken more up, I'd taken um, act more after my mother, who's a registered nurse. Um, I'd think of her red-headed take charge persona and ask, what would mother do in this situation? So uh, it wasn't that my nurse mother had all the answers about taking care of her own children. I recall that when I was in labor with my first child, Corrine, mother had wanted to help. She was a labor and delivery room nurse, and she had a very different relationship, though, to medical, to the Western medicine than I had. So I had tried to demedicalize my pregnancy and delivery, being among the first wave of women in Western a culture that told doctors that having a baby and becoming a mother was not a disease. But a natural process. Following in the footsteps of an older woman I admired, uh, I took the childbirth preparation courses with my husband so that he could be with me. And I'll be probably all. It's, so, it's so common now that you can't imagine what a difficult time it was in my day. I just want to tell you, you know, I'm not going to complain. But, <laughs> I mean, I was forced to change doctors twice when one of them told me that my husband could be with me when I was not in active labor. And I said to him, when I'm not in active labor, I'm not coming in. <laughs> so uh, anyway, but mother's role was very difficult to define because, see, she was with people when they delivered. And according to friends who had known her and had her on their team, she was the best but she rarely seen a labor and delivered without anesthesia, and certainly not one that set it out purposefully in that direction. So um, I saw, even, the dim, even in the dim labor room light, her switching back and forth between her role as a nurse and her role as my mother. So, of course, I was too preoccupied to really comfort her, but later we both agreed. <laughs> Standing by, feeling helpless, while I'm appearing to be suffering, made this process harder on her than it was on me. <laughs> For my stroke around next two births, she was happy to stay home and take care of the grandchildren. <laughs> so, after 16 plus hours of labor and the birth of my daughter, a young 20-somethings male intern was bending over my hospital bed. His voice reverberated with disgust that sounded like accusation, and he said, she looks like she's been hit by shrapnel. Pushing on my flaccid, sore abdomen, the chief doctor enlightened the cadre of white-coated male residents surrounding us about stretch marks. Now, this is a particularly dramatic example of strade doctorum, uh, scarring on the skin due to pregnancy. Uh, note that the purple lines and red marks caused by, are just not by a of stretching, but by hormonal changes and genetics. They will lighten a bit, but they will never completely disappear. I was not yet 22 years old, 23 years old. I was elated at my good fortune of being uh, delivered a healthy baby girl, yet I was also thinking I'm now marked for life as someone who has been in life. No bikini bathing suit for me, and just when I was getting up the courage to wear one, <laughs> my dancer's body would now require a cover up. In the past 40 years, I've gotten a fuller appreciation for the stretch marks that mothering brings. And I, and I was about to find out for myself how hard it is to be in that mother of the patient role. So, um, I was mad. It's my default reaction when anything big and negative happens. But this time I was really mad. Two years after uh, I was in California, a couple of weeks before Christmas in 1993, I was standing in the main lobby of the hospital, just outside the cafeteria, with the smell of burnt coffee and greasy french fries, talking to my ex-husband, George. Dwarfed by the high ceilings, we stood in hyper-polished hyper antiseptic corridors, struggling to have a private conversation. We'd been divorced 18 years by then, longer than we'd been married, and our son, Ken, had been admitted to the hospital the day before with pneumonia. And although the hospital ward was currently hosting people with six types of pneumonia, the doctor had already expressed 
strong suspicion that Ken's could be pneumocystis pneumonia. 1993, that was the working definition of AIDS. And George and I knew that. I pushed the hair back out of my eyes as I attempted to make sense of this frightening possibility. Of course, he told me he was taking care of himself. I blurted out at George. It's not like we never talked about it. I could hear the fear underneath the anger in my own voice. George, slender, six foot three, with a full head of grayish white hair, looked like he always looked when I got emotional, stoic and distant. Pacing the narrow hallway, he gestured into the ho hospital corridor. It's a disgrace, he barked. Only thing on your menu for vegetarians like me is a dried out salad. Bar. George, a recovering alcoholic and triple bypass survivor, had determinedly never allowed any alcohol, fat, or meat to cross his lips since his surgery five years before. How is it we get to go straight to the head of the class? I spat into the words into the atmosphere. No 10 years of symptom free HIV status. No time to try alternative approaches to staying healthy. I thought about the university courses I taught for social workers and healthcare. In my article, Moving Beyond the Medical Model, What Social Workers Need to Know, I know things that strengthen the immune system, biofeedback, detoxifying regimens of herbs, and other body-mind approaches. But aloud, I said, nothing I know will be any use now. This conversation wasn't much different from others in the 30 years uh, that I've known George. Uh, George seemed to be studying the patterns on the floor. <laughs> when are these people going to wise up, he continued. They pay no attention to nutrition, and then they wonder why people get sick. And where was the Centers for Disease Control, I raged? Why didn't they pay more attention when that, this disease first came on the scene? Finally looking me in the eye, former radio broadcaster George said in his most professional newscaster cadence, they ignored it because it was discovered in gay men. So I would like to uh, ask some of my uh, troop if you would come. We're going to do the Pittsburgh form. And um, the scene what, that we're going to be dealing with is um, <laughs> Mothers worry, mothers, fathers worry, mothers worry. What that's like in you that you know, either that you're the mother or your own mother, how she was, whatever. So um, we could, um, we're going to need a musician and uh, people that would be willing to do the Pittsburgh form on that theme. I was talking to him on the phone one day 
about my new job. And he was there alone. And he was reading a magazine before he talked to me. And he said, and what percentage exactly of your new job relates to the selling of hams? Fathers worry differently than mothers. We get mad and aggravated because things aren't working out exactly the way we want them to. And it's that lack of control over making things be the way we want them to be. Kevin does that to me every day. And so I listen carefully to what he says, so that I understand him better. Sometimes it feels like the world is whirling around. I don't know what to do. So I hang on and I focus and I decide, go for it. Before my own dramatic need for one. 
And so I knew the importance of taking care of myself. I knew that to be able to support Ken as he was dealing with this life-threatening disease, I needed to do everything I could to stay healthy myself. I also had the example of my mother and her failure to thrive during and after the ordeal she went through with her son, who was my younger brother. His name was Kenny, and he had my son was named after him, and he disappeared a few weeks before his 26th birthday. Now, he was born just before my ninth birthday, and he was everybody's favorite in the family, the golden boy, the golden child. We four older kids would fight over who would get to hold him, who would get to take him for walks and sit by him when he was old enough to sit at the children's table. In his teens, he had explored being a priest, but before his disappearance, he was living in a teepee involved in a tribe in New Mexico as it reinstated the Sundance Festival. I remember finding that involvement interesting because I was also involved in Native Americans in Nebraska. And we don't really, as far as we know, have any heritage in that, uh, you know, with Native Americans, but at least not uh, at that point where. <laughs> the 16 months of not knowing what happened to my brother, Kenny, was difficult for all the members of our family, but it was excruciating for my mother. She would imagine scenarios that could explain his disappearance yet would still allow him to be alive. Perhaps he was in a prison in Mexico, having been found with a marijuana cigarette in his pocket. Perhaps he was in an accident without any identification on him, and he was now having amnesia and couldn't contact us. She lit candles, prayed the rosary, and sent money and prayer requests to monasteries and convents, beseeching them to pray for her safe to return home. In the second autumn after his disappearance, two hunters found a body in a national forest in New Mexico. My parents were notified and asked for the dental records, and they confirmed that the body was my brother's. The autopsy report determined the cause of his death to be a bullet delivered at close range to the back of his head. Our family had a funeral, and we burial service with his remains in the town where he grew up. But then this, within six months of the funeral, nearly every remaining family member experienced a major illness. One sister had esophageal surgery. Another made a middle of the night trip to the emergency room with an ovary that had burst for no explainable medical reason. A brother had stomach problems and I had colitis type symptoms that persisted for several years. Healthy before and since, our father had a kidney stone, but, and mother had a heart attack. While teaching a course at the university, family systems, I drew all of this on the board. You know, the esophageal thing, and the kidney thing, and, the, and I stood back from it, and I realized that our family was one body, and we each carried the pain of Ken's loss in a different organ. We all recovered except mother. Looking back now, it's clear she never survived the death of her son. She remained in ill health to the end of her life. Eight years later, she had a diet of pancreatic cancer. She struggled with but could never reconcile how her peace-loving son, Kenny, a conscientious objector during, uh, during the Vietnam War, who did alternative service in a hospital rather than carry a weapon, how could he have died by after my son Ken's diagnosis, I returned to the sense of the family as one body. I prayed not only for him, but for myself, his two fathers, his brother, his sister, and all of those whose lives he touched. So uh, the theme is really about the family as one body and how we are so connected, even though we think of ourselves as being so connected. Um, I've asked my husband Richard to come and do uh, a form with me on that notion of the family as one body. I'm going to take my thoughts on the phone. I don't want to The David young ladies earlier showed us how much fun it can be to fall. I know. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I saw that. I noticed that. I, I, I did. I know. I noticed that. But I, I, more a higher up than that. <laughs> yes. <laughs>
remember the first death that I experienced. I was about eight. And my brothers and I, back in New York City, were playing stoop ball. And my older brother came out from the house to tell me that my Uncle Aaron, my father's closest brother, had just died of a heart attack. And my dad and my mom were headed over to New Jersey to be with the family. I didn't really know about that. I loved, idolized my father. And I didn't know what it would be like. What should I say to him? How should I treat him? Should I give him a hug? Should I leave him alone? I didn't know what to do. So my father grew up in a family of eight kids. It was a farm family, and he was the seventh child. The year he turned five, both his parents died. So he was raised by his older brothers and sisters. And they were the most amazing group of people you've ever seen. What I remember about them, well, first of all, they didn't talk a lot, which was really different from most of them. But, and, and if anyone, if there was a funeral, and they came to the funeral of my brother, they came very quietly. They sat very quiet in the living room. They rocked in the rocking chair very quiet. They were just there. They were just there. Oh, I, I said we're waiting in the morning. And he said, first of all, well, I, I said we're when have you been on the road? And he said, oh, well, I don't know, your sister, what's taking her so long? And then he stopped and he said, I don't imagine you're calling with good news. And I said, no. I said, Ken died at 1.45 last night on the summer solstice. And he said, oh, honey. Mm -hmm. it, it, in a voice that reminded me that I was his little girl. So then he said, just a minute. And then he got off the phone, and I was like, well, is he thinking? I mean, what, he was 87 years old. And so, um, and, and I didn't know, and then, and then pretty soon he came back, and he said, um, okay, well, uh, if we leave, if I get your sister going here, if we leave in, in the next hour, I figure we can go to Dallas and then head on over. Uh, we'll go to Jacksonville and then head over to Dallas, and we should be there by tomorrow afternoon. Exactly, but they decided not to review it. So the woman said, well, 
Could you give us an idea of why you were not going to leave? And whoever the person was said, well, we just weren't sure that this really had a broad enough appeal. It didn't have a broad enough appeal. So, I mean, I'm sure that if the, if the appeal is that every person who has lost two children, that's probably true. That would be a fairly slender market. But um, as I think I can see it, you can demonstrate it here, there is no one in this room that has not experienced and will not experience uh, many of the things that we in our family have experienced and will experience. So, um, so I want to um, I want to read a section now about living with illness. I mean, is there a family that's never heard of I think we should uh, do some kind of a DNA uh, uh, touch on the that's the case, right? I mean, come on. So anyway, that's the theme that I'm uh, selecting right now, is living with an illness. So we've taken the name in our summers. The first summer, after Corrine's breast cancer diagnosis, she was taking chemotherapy every three weeks. In the rhythm and pattern so familiar to cancer patients in treatment, the first week she went from bed to bathroom to couch and then she repeated that dance. The second week she might make it a little uh, to a little league baseball game or a school program, but then she would be totally wiped out because every action required lots of rest to the color. By the third week she would begin to feel almost normal and of course then she would start the process all over. Corinne loved being a mom. She loved being able to arrange her summer work schedule at the therapy clinic to have time for trips to the swimming pool and the library, for bike rides on the trails, for craft projects at the dining room table. But that summer, family, neighbors, friends helped out, and the children were asked to be more, uh, to do more for themselves. Instead of mom doing everything for the children, the kids, who were 10, 8, and 4 at the time, learned to make their own beds pick up their own dishes, set the table, and put dishes in the sink. We call that summer the summer of self-sufficiency. The following summer, that was the summer of her bone marrow transplant, that became the summer of sanitation. The children had to learn about germs and how they are carried and transferred and how to prevent them uh, from happening. They practiced washing their hands thoroughly and often and learn to take their time soaping and rinsing by singing a few lines of a song. Happy birthday to you, happy birthday. Any song works. If you go through the whole song, it works. <laughs> so we all developed the practice of coughing into the crook of our elbows and using antibacterial gel that we carried in our pockets. All this and helping keep the kitchen and bathroom services clean because the kids' part in protecting their mom and themselves from getting sick. They came to understand the need for these special precautions because of the immune uh, suppression drug she would be taking and the fact that her new baby immune system would be just developing its ability to recognize the invaders that could cause infection. An extra incentive? They couldn't visit her in Houston if they were sick. Before it became a sick room, the den served as a communication network and organizing center for the household. A wooden computer cabinet with a printer and a cork board posted with sheets of phone numbers and the kids' sports team schedules kept the family on top of who needed to be where and when. Across from the computer cabinet, Corrine's gr grandfather's antique deck was a spot for sorting mail, paying bills, and shedding and sh shredding the uh, flyers, advertising flyers. A beige <coughs> love seat nestled in a front window was just the right size for reading or being made read to from one of the many books on the floor to see when the book is a case wall. The current scene was not something that had ever been imagined for this family or anyone who knew him. Corrine and Bill had met in high school as cheerleader and football player, courted long distance during college, and married a year or so after graduation. He earned an MBA, she a physical therapy degree, before they started their family. Independent, capable, and responsible, they were most often the ones who helped others. But now those tales were turned. 
Throughout the past two and a half years, Bill and Corinne's friends from high school, co-workers from the clinic where she worked, neighbors, parents of the children's friends, and ladies from their small little church all took turns tending to the needs of this family. It was difficult at first, especially for Bill, to accept this much, this much help from people. But Corinne told him, people want to help. They want to do something. You know how good it feels for us to give to someone else. Well, that's what we're giving to them when we let them help us. For two and a half years, someone delivered a meal to this house for five evenings a week. Someone shopped for birthday presents and Christmas gifts, and someone wrapped them. Someone drove the kids to soccer and basketball practice, piano lessons, and play dates when mom and dad were out of town for her treatments. Someone handled her email communication to keep everyone informed of her progress and what tasks needed doing. The only glitch would involve some of the ladies from church who didn't have or were already taken by that time they had a chance. The self-organized village did whatever it could, all the while hoping and praying it would be enough, enough to avoid what was happening now. So I would like to have my two members who are willing to um, do the form of um, walk, stop, run, no frills for the lead. <laughs> Walk, stop, run. No frills. Very simple. And then the other the frill you can do is a lean. So let's see. Can you, can you do it? So you, you'll just all start going. So you, 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 you'll, uh, you, the Stefan, you'll start us off. And, uh, and, uh, yeah. Okay. Take a deep breath.
she would say to me, I'm much more conservative than you are, mother. And my friend would say, oh, thank goodness she chose that direct direction to be different from you. <laughs> anyway, uh, but um, she, uh, <coughs> She, that she was a doing person, a doing, which, she, which I am as well. So, um, so when she learned that when she was getting her bone marrow transplant, she would need to be in the hospital for two weeks and not really be sick, but you can't be doing, you can't go anywhere because, you know, you, it would be too dangerous for you to become, um, with your immune system, to be exposed. So she thought, what am I going to do? What am I going to do in there for two whole weeks? So she came up with the idea, because by now she had been traveling back and forth and many, many people knew about her situation and they would forward her emails that she would send that were really sort of spiritual journey descriptions along with medical updates. And so, so many people were getting her information and rooting for her. So she got the idea that she would um, ask them to send her their pictures. And then she would pray for them because she didn't have anything else to do. <laughs> so, so we saw the beginning of her wall of prayer, which was something she had come up with while I was in Brazil. When she learned that she would be in the hospital in semi-isolation, what am I going to do with myself? So she came up with it. She asked people to send, and they could tell her what she was supposed to pray for or not. That was fine, and uh, so the prayer wall grew daily as the mail arrived. As it turned out, many more people than we had realized were praying for her. The emails she'd been sending to inform friends and family of her condition and uh, during the Houston trips, they had made it, been forwarded to many, many other people. Her emails were inspiring, and they forwarded were forwarded to friends we didn't know. Many of those people began praying and many responded to her offer to pray for them by sending their pictures. The staff who entered the room questions about the many portraits and snapshots that were filling the wall. A hospital chaplain learned about the wall and asked to continue her for the, uh, news, uh, the uh, hospital newsletter. He often wrote about the ways patients cope with the stress of being in the hospital. He thought this was something most unusual and the number of pictures grew. I began to realize that my daughter's energy and influence were growing way beyond the confines of our family and our small community. By the end of her two-week hospital stay, the wall had grown to 60 or so pictures, enough to fill two large poster frames that I bought to transfer the wall to the apartment where we were when she was discharged. She told me later, I asked God to use me, to use me, for his greater purposes. It was clear her prayers were being answered. She was being used beyond anything my protective mother instincts would have selected for her. Mm. Years later, I read about a principle in Zen. Generosity is the antidote to fear. Mm -hmm. I thought of Corinne's prayer wall and how she had focused on others in the midst of her own challenges and how that became a gift to her as well. So I'm going to ask Judith if she's around. Judith. 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 <laughs> and somebody else named Chet. So you can come and perform, please. Uh, so uh, I would like you and uh, Lisa to come. Okay. And uh, they're going to do a uh, contact duet. Oh, and I'm going to come over here by you, so we might make up something. Uh, so, uh, okay. So, uh, so this is a contact duet form.
company. We need a few people over here to help make music with Stefan, and we need some movers. So, going, but I'll give you a chance to assemble here.
pickup troop, I guess we would call it <laughs> here. Uh, some of the people are from uh, this area, from Broad Borough, some from um, Hartford, Connecticut, yeah. yeah. yes, and uh, I'm from Pittsburgh, and uh, who else is, what other towns are from? Seattle. Seattle, yes, yes. Seattle. yes. Wisconsin. Wisconsin, yes, yes. So we have interplayed 60 cities in the United States, and then we're on five continents. So uh, we, uh, this is our 25th anniversary this year. Uh, October 25th is actually the beginning of the anniversary year. And so you might be hearing more about that uh, from Judith and some of the people here. And uh, there will be also interplay classes that are happening here. So um, we Can you say to... more about October 25th? Well, what's actually happening, I think I understand this. You know, it's a little before my time when, you know, this <laughs> I mean, after my time, not before my time. Uh, there, there will be a fundraiser in Oakland, California, which they do every year at 10.30 in the morning, and then will be live streamed to uh, Pittsburgh and uh, to um, North Carolina and to Seattle and I, I'm not sure how many uh, places at the same time. So we'll be, you know, waving at one another, I guess, and celebrating together and, uh, uh, and celebrating all of what's been accomplished in 25 years and looking forward to the big leap that we're going to take, right? Yes, yes, <laughs> we're yes. We're about to take a leap yes. into, yeah. uh, into a, a bigger uh, arena. So, yeah. And the millennials, the young folks are coming in and every year in Berkeley, we, in Oakland, we have, is it a week or two? Two weeks. It's two weeks. And we bring young people in from all over the world to play with interplay and social justice. So if you know anybody who might like to do that, we pretty much give a lot of scholarships for that because we really want to pass this on to the next gen. Mm -hmm. yeah. Are you guys also going to do a video? Because we also have a video project that they have initiated for us. Uh, we're, we're photographing ourselves in some iconic place that represents our city. Mm. and uh, like three minute video and these will be run every uh, 25th of every month so you will see one from Seattle and well now we've got the Vermont New Hampshire connection uh -huh. and this family and Anya uh, was learned uh, as I did interplay in Oakland and uh, she does it in Keene and I do it here um, and a bunch of us do it here and uh, um, my new classes are the, the flyer for the new classes is out there, first and third Saturday of the month. Very strange time, five to seven, and it works gloriously, and sometimes we have a potluck afterwards. So besides the fact that you're going to be telling all of your friends yes. about this, right, you're going, and, I, and I'm going to be signing books over there if you would like to have them, give an incredible shout out to this woman. Just all these different 
people at all these different ages interplay for about four or five minutes. <laughs>